That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about the film Knocking, the directorial debut of Frida Kempf, uh, which premiered, or is about to premiere, <laughs> in the Midnight Program at the 2021 Sundance Film Festival. This film is about... Well, it's set in Sweden, right? Yeah, it's a Swedish film. It's, brave, it's based on a novel by Johan Theorin. Uh, it's kind of a, a pulp novelist uh, whose a previous book of his... Um, was called Echoes of the Dead, was made into a film by Daniel Eldredson, who directed the second two films of the original Swedish Girl with the Dragon Tattoo trilogy, and is the brother of Thomas Eldredson, who you know from Let the Right One In, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, a very terrible uh, Hollywood film called The Snowman. Okay. This film is about a woman named Molly. Mm -hmm. So we find Molly being discharged from a psychiatric unit. So it looks like she was on like a like a 72 hour hold or something over an incident that's not made clear. She is taken to her new apartment mm -hmm. and is settling in when she starts to hear knocking. And it's slowly sort of like drives her crazy because she starts hearing voices. She does confront uh, a couple of neighbors asking like, are you doing anything because I'm hearing this knocking, I'm hearing someone talking. They're saying no. She, it culminates with her um, again hearing knocking, hearing voices. She goes upstairs and starts screaming at the person who she thinks is responsible. And then several characters, characters who she has already had interactions with start to surround her and say like, hey, you need help. You're obviously not well. And she breaks into the apartment of the person who she thinks is responsible, uh, grabs a knife, harms one of the gentlemen, and then threatens the occupant of the apartment to open this locked door where she believes the sound is coming from. Mm -hmm. And when he opens it, there is someone in there, but it's his mother who's clearly suffering from like dementia or something and wheelchair bound. Mm -hmm. So that kind of explains what she's hearing perhaps. So she uh, is taken to uh, like a facility to get help, a mental health facility. She breaks out of it, mm -hmm. goes back to her apartment, starts hearing noises again. And there's a plot point where like on her ceiling, she sees like a rusty spot. And now that rusty spot's turned into like a bloody spot that's dripping. And the next thing we know, it bursts into flames. Mm -hmm. Cut to the next scene. This is the end of the film. She is outside of the apartment building being treated by emergency personnel. Mm -hmm. And then we hear, um, oh, we, how do you refer to it when you hear that over what we're seeing? Like near, like oh, a, like near, uh, omniscient dialogue. Anyway, we hear a 911 call from, or a 112, whatever they use in Sweden, from the superintendent of the apartment building, and we hear that, like, it's on fire. So, assuming Molly set the place on fire. When the operator says, hey, I hear something, and he says, oh, it's nothing, but then we hear that there's, like, a woman, and then that's when like cops come into his apartment and they see that a woman is chained up in his apartment. The end. We, we don't see any of that. We don't see any we of it. We just hear the happening. operator talking. As Molly's being uh, worked on, she seems incapacitated and then she opens her eyes and then we get the end credits. So the, what I took away from was, yes, this woman is having sort of like a psychiatric break and suffering from anxiety and paranoia. So there's that component, but also there was someone like chained up in that apartment knocking, asking for help. I think that is one interpretation of it. I think that deliberate, the filmmaker is very deliberately making it ambiguous because the re you could also read that as that, ex that auditory exchange is also happening inside her, her mind. Sure. So I think the story's cool. Um, knowing <laughs> that it's based off of a book, I'm, I'm thinking that I would enjoy the book. But this film is only 78 minutes. It's short. And a lot of time is spent just witnessing this woman sort of like hearing knocking. <laughs> and I kind of wish that, you know, you have an extra 12 minutes before it becomes like tedious. I wish maybe like explaining, I mean, the ambiguity of like not knowing whether or not there actually was a woman 
could work, except that, you know, they threw it in at the end. Sure. And really, if you're watching this in Swedish, like you don't have subtitles and you miss like what the person's saying, you wouldn't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> the only reason I got it because it was like subtitled and I could read what the operator was saying. I don't like when those very important plot points are like, just like, boop, blinking, it's gone. Okay. But anyway. Uh, the filmmaker, or uh, the description of the film is about, it's supposed to be a treatment of how gaslight culture stigmatizes the mentally ill. Uh, which is interesting, but this is... Oh, yeah, I can see that. This is ostensibly uh, in a long line of film uh, history of women going crazy in an apartment, from Catherine Deneuve in Repulsion to uh, Susanna York in Images. Uh, you, know, you know, there's a, a lot of stiff competition here. Uh, I will say I really liked uh, Cecilia Maloko's uh, lead performance as mm -hmm. Molly. We actually meet her um, having come to find a memory where she's lying on a beach on the sand and she's being caressed by a woman who, based on her behavior, seems to be her lover uh, and goes and wanders off to go swimming. And we keep repeating, we, we keep going back to that memory and it, it, it seems clear that this is the trauma. Like something happened to that woman, whether she was drowned or attacked by a shark, we don't know, we don't see it. Uh, but uh, Attacked by a shark. <laughs> well, because th there's a scene where she wakes up in that memory and everybody's staring towards the water and she runs into it and then the camera right. just... Uh, glides over the surface of this beautiful green aquamarine water, but we don't see what happened. There's a lot of ambiguity. The, the film, like the story feels familiar, like you said. There's lust of competition related to this topic. It's very short. I almost feel like this felt like a short. Like sure. this movie could have been 23 minutes. It also reminds me a bit of, um, sorry, wrong number, where Barbara Stanwyck is an invalid uh, and overhears somebody plotting a murder uh, on the phone uh, and is trying to con tell all these people and confront them just as Molly is and nobody will believe her. But also how she approaches them is like very crazy. Right. Uh, Which is frustrating. I was more frustrated with her character yes. than anything. Um, and which is, you know, the, the feelings that are supposed to be evoked is knowing that she's going to be misinterpreted, uh, she's going to be, uh, uh, she, she's already vulnerable and no, no one's going to believe her, she has no evidence. Um, so some important points, uh, the other three main characters are the superintendent of her building introduces himself to her immediately and he seems like like a nice guy. We get a few scenes of him like exercising, like he's running. Mm -hmm. Then we have the neighbor who she confronts initially regarding the knocking. And he appears to be wearing like military guard. Mm -hmm. He has a very interesting bowl haircut. He just seems like a weirdo to me, but I don't know, maybe in Sweden that's the look. But I thought he was supposed to be almost like Nazi. That's what I thought. Yeah. So he kind of throws us off and he's the one who ends up having his like, uh, senile mother locked in a room. Mm -hmm. The third gentleman is another neighbor who she confronts about knocking. And he says, like, there's nothing going on, sorry. But at a point, Molly goes to look for help because there's like a bird in her apartment that dies and she goes to bury it like out in front of her building. There's, it, yeah. And it, it's like the in the late of night and she's burying this bird when she sees that neighbor the one I just mentioned, throw the garbage, throw some garbage into the dumpster. So she goes and looks through his garbage and she sees a bloodied garment. Mm -hmm. So she's convinced that he's doing harming some woman. So we, we see Molly attempting to contact emergency services a number of times and they tell her like, listen, if you keep calling here with these fake ass problems, we're going to block your number. Mm -hmm. So Molly ends up running to like a police station, but it ends up being like like customs and border like administrative like, like an administrative like, office where they issue passports yeah which didn't really make sense to me like she doesn't like is she not from sweden she doesn't know where the cops are or the difference well i think she'd been turned away from the cops that should deal with that so oh maybe can't. yes that makes sense so when she goes and asks for help they're like listen this is not the place but if you take a number and sit your ass down we'll get to you eventually and they finally tell her like hey step around back and someone will help you and when the door opens it's a law enforcement agent who happens to be that same neighbor who threw out the garbage. Mm -hmm. So she's freaked out and immediately runs out. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's another neighbor, a couple on the same floor 
who she calls 112 on. I think the initial call to them is because she hears them arguing outside and the woman may be tr being treated poorly. That's right, and when the cops show up, they're like, no, we're just talking. Which I think overall we're supposed to look at this is if, you, any, if you're looking at anything from a certain perspective, you can find the suspicious evidence you'd like. Which I think in a book would be very satisfying. Sure. And, and, more, and I think more satisfying to analyze. But in this film, uh, they just seem like red herrings, like very basic. And then the one person who isn't exhibiting any red flags is the one who at the end, the her superintendent, who we are made to understand did have a woman chained up in his apartment. So that seemed kind of basic to me in its presentation. But I think had it been flushed out more, I would have been much more satisfied. Sure, but at the same time, I think you can look at it as if that really is all in her head, the only person with the red herring is logically what she's doing in her mind to explain to herself. Yes, that makes right. sense, but I think to witness it was very like, girl... Muted, yeah. it's it's uh, Like she I, just comes across... I, I, crazy is a dismissive word we shouldn't be using, but she just comes across as crazy. Narratively, it's dry, but, yeah. you know, there, there are little cues I liked. I, like, my first note was that little bird that she ends up burying is... She sees it uh, on her porch, and it's having a hard time gripping the... Um, railing which to me meant that's a metaphor for her she's having a hard time getting a grip here getting a grip on reality what, what i appreciated a little less was the the visual cue of right before she's released from the uh the institution that she's been in there's a black and white television playing and it's just the briefest clip from uh ingmar bergman's persona which which is you know I know you haven't seen and you must, that, that, that's must-see cinema, uh, but that is about two women, you know, I have a shirt that I often wear in these that's from that film, and it's about two women who's uh, stuck together on, in this place whose uh, personalities converge, there's this switch. Um, I, I thought that was a little bit too easy, easy of a cue for that, um, and also I would hope that someone in that situation would be watching that movie <laughs> uh, in the institution. Yeah, why would she be... <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's just a very curious choice. Like that could have been on the television at her home, and I think that would have been more fitting for me. Um, but oh, I really liked how it looked. Uh, mm -hmm. Hannes Kratz was the director of photography, uh, particularly in the scenes where she's really unraveling, uh, and you get all those uh, f uh, sped up shots. Uh, from her perspective where she's wandering around on that floor and breaking it almost her. looked like she was I almost for a second I also liked that shot or that scene but it almost looked like she was like taking video mm -hmm. of yeah. herself until we see her raise both of her yeah. arms but for for all of it I thought she was capturing her own video maybe to prove so I kind of wish that would have been the case because when she lifted her arms up I'm like oh she's not even no but it's, I, I thought that but was effective it did look cool yes I also like the score by Martin Durkoff, who uh, has composed scores for uh, Ali Abbasi's uh, last two films. Um, All the Ali Oxen Free. Okay. Shelley and uh, that film Border, which I tried to get your interest in, about those strange creatures at the border. What creatures? I didn't want to watch There's like strange creature-like people at the border. and He must not have sold it well. I, you watched the preview. Oh. <sighs> anyway, um, what would you give this film? I would give it three out of five. Yeah, I agree. I think it's I think it's actually quite good for a first film. It also seems like something that would is going to be immediately remade in English. I'm not mad. Or if there's a director's cut with those extra twelve minutes you could have used, that would be nice too. <laughs> and you know I like a short film, but but so that's a testament to this story. Like I was intrigued. Like I would I, I wanted a little bit more. Sure. Anyway. Bye. Bye. Thank you.